And so here we go. So I actually came up with this title um, for a couple years ago, but uh, I've delayed this one because uh, the skeptics talks folk wanted something a little more on the skepticism side. Um, so Terminator pigs, walking whales, and demon ducks, wonders of the world after the dinosaurs. So yeah, so we got BAM, we have a big crater, and then it goes from the age of dinosaurs to the age of cavemen. OK, no. There's actually more to it than that. Um, and of course, we have this spectacular stuff at the end of the age of dinosaurs, the Ice Age. So here's a wonderfully preserved uh, mammoth head um, and a, a juvenile woolly rhino from that same locality. Um, but there's a lot that happens in between impact and, uh, and the cold. And there are, are many famous things that go on during this time that a lot of you are familiar with. In fact, things that are featured as sort of standard textbook information, like the radiation, uh, uh, the origin and radiation of horses, as a great example of macroevolutionary patterns as they diversify into many different things. Or, uh, in fact, the, the adaptive radiation of placental mammals themselves in the consequence of the great extinction event. In fact, something I didn't really appreciate until this last year, I found out that the term adaptive radiation was coined in the context of this. So lots of textbooks will talk about Darwin's uh, look at the finches, or in fact, what he really looked at at the time, because he recognized they were a group, or prickly pears on the Galapagos, which radiated. The term adaptive radiation was not one that was used until Osborne talked about the radiation of mammals at the end of the age of or after the end of the age of dinosaurs. So just to familiarize yourself, we are here at the top where it says Holocene. Uh, this is the Cenozoic era, the age of recent life, and it's subdivided into many units, but you don't need to worry about them. Um, so what I'm mostly going to be emphasizing here is to begin with that the Cenozoic was more than an age of mammals. It's not like the other groups of animals stopped evolving, um, and that the diversity is more than just the ancestors of the modern survivors. Of course, it is including the ancestors of the moderns, the, the early rhinos, the early horses, the early apes, and so forth. But there's a lot of groups that have subsequently gone extinct without issue. So for instance, yeah, exactly. You know, We don't think about much in the terms of the evolution of invertebrates during uh, the age of mammals, during the Cenozoic. And there's some groups that are very familiar to us that occur at that time, like the sand dollars show up. But here's a little, a little trivia item that I wasn't really aware of, um, because it isn't emphasized, is there were big ass shelled cephalopods in the Cenozoic. I mean, we know that for the Mesozoic. Uh, aminoids were really common parts of the, of the Cenozoic, of the, so the Mesozoic, some of whom had shell diameters up to about two meters. Um, but this is, as projected, about life size, the largest nautiloid of the Cenozoic. Uh, now, it was in the early parts of the Cenozoic, in the Paleocene and Eocene, when the oceans were warmer and sort of more duplicated the conditions of the Cretaceous period. It's a cousin of today's nautilus. And in fact, they've gave, given it uh, the modern nautilus color patterns, although we don't know for certain what color patterns it had. Um, and here it is, you know, in honor of, of Baltimore, you know, it's eating a blue crab. So um, <laughs> even though this is a specimen from Florida. So, uh, or based on a specimen from Florida. And of course, we are familiar with the fact that there are some important aspects of fish evolution. Mostly, the Cenozoic is the age of Megalodon. So, uh, Caracles Megalodon, about to eat some of my students. Um, this is actually down at the Calvert Marine Museum, if you ever go down to visit there. That we don't actually have complete skeletons of big Megalodon because uh, the nature of sharks is that their skeletons were cartilage surrounded by little crystals of harder minerals, but in death those crystals disassociate from the, uh, from the skeletal material and it's generally not all together. But the teeth preserve very well. It turns out Megalodon is just one of many sorts of giant sharks of the Cenozoic. <laughs> and this is at an exhibit down in um, the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. So these jaws, if I remember correctly, are a great white. 
Those are Megalodon. But as you can see, there are other giant sharks in the first half of the Cenozoic and some until the second half of the Cenozoic um, that would be chomping on early whales and each other and so forth. Um, also, it turns out that in uh, parts of South America, in the first few, first 10 million years or so of the age of mammals, the reptiles didn't get the memo. And for a while there, they were the largest and dominant creatures in the environment. So they're mostly from the Cerrillon Formation of Colombia, uh, where all the large-bodied animals that have been found at that locality are members of reptile groups. Um, so we've got uh, Carbonimus, the, the coal turtle, uh, a giant turtle, one of the largest freshwater turtles in Earth history. There are a number of, uh, of crocodilians, including, and that's and actually Anthracosuchus balrogi. Um, so it is a, uh, um, oh, Anthracosuchus means coal croc. So uh, you might be guessing, it's a coal deposit. But the most famous inhabitant is Titanoboa. And this is the one time in Earth history where the largest animals that existed, that we know of, were snakes. Because at the time that uh, Titanoboa lived, whales were still quite small and they were walking and they lived in stream systems of, of Indo-Pakistan. Uh, there were no large bodied mammals that rivaled Titanoboa at the time. So this is the, the one, the gasp of glory for the cold blooded reptiles. And so here we've got Titanoboa um, trying to eat Anthracosuchus. Just the way, oh, Titan, sorry. Titanoboa gets, um, the specimens we have look like it's on the order of about 42 feet long. So it's, it's actually, nope, yeah, uh, giant, giant nopes. Um, so they were, uh, and they actually are in the, um, um, in the anaconda lineage, in the, bo in the boa anaconda lineage. Um, so giant constrictors. A and just as today, we have anacondas will go after um, caiman. Here's a reconstruction of Titanoboa going after one of the, the big crocs of its environment. <laughs> Uh, another group that survived pretty well were crocodilians. And again, crocodilians had a, a lower have a lower metabolic rate than, um, uh, than did dinosaurs. In fact, it looks like crocodilians had a downshift in their metabolic rate, that their ancestors had a higher metabolic rate, the ones of the Triassic and Jurassic. Yeah, and here's, yeah, so here is um, uh, a Pristachampsine. Um, so it's uh, a hoofed terrestrial crocodile from the Eocene, so from about 55 to 35 million years ago, uh, munching on its traditional prey, which are early horses. The early horses uh, seem to exist to be prey for non-mammals of the time, uh, because they're almost always illustrated being munched on by either birds or crocs. Uh, and here is a, a skeleton of one of these guys. Um, it's the skull flipped over on its side, so you're seeing underneath the jaw, slightly smeared over. Uh, and here's a reconstructed skeleton of it. What's the hoof? It says hoof. Hoofed. So the ends of, their, of their, uh, their fingers, the ends of the claws, sort of flatten out rather than point forward. So they would have had, instead of having the claws that we see in typical modern crocodilians, flatter, more hoof-like things for walking around on the ground. So, In the case when we're talking here about the Eocene, temperatures are about as warm as they are in the Mesozoic. In fact, the, the, the mid-Eocene is the hottest time that's existed since the end of the age of dinosaurs. So and it's probably not a coincidence that we're getting the giant snakes and crocodiles and turtles at that time. Although we have giant crocodiles that show up later on. So here are super crocs of various sorts. Now these two super crocs, um, Sar Sarcosuchus here, um, and Dinosuchus are contemporaries of dinosaurs, of the giant dinosaurs. But the rest of these guys are Cenozoic forms. So Crocodilus prorsus on the bottom, that is our, uh, th that's the, the saltwater crocodile of Australia, the largest living crocodilian. Uh, but we can see several other very giant forms, including uh, Purusaurus, probably the largest crocodilian in Earth history. It's a relative of the Caymans. Um, and I hate to say this as a Tyrannosaur worker, but probably had the strongest bite of any carnivorous animal <laughs> ever, ever, ever looked at. Um, and it turns out that we would have environments where there were 
tremendous numbers and diversity of crocodilians living side by side. So when Purusaurus was around, there, there's its skull in top view, there were baleen crocs, crocs that were sort of a suspension feeders that would gulp up small bodied fish and sort of filter them out past their teeth. Uh, there were snub nosed crocodilians, there were gavialoid forms living side by side, in this case in the Amazon. Uh, in the Miocene. So this would be something like uh, 15 million years ago or so. So here we have just looking at some of the diversity of, of the radiation of crocodilians going on in the, in the Cenozoic. So it's true, the Cenozoic is not simply an age of mammals. Um, but of course, it is an age of mammals. And it is when mammals got a lot of their great diversity going on. Uh, in the wake of the great extinction event, there's a lot of radiation of the placental mammals and also radiation of the marsupials, uh, but it's actually more than that. So in the living world, we have three major groups of mammals. There are the placentals, which are by far the most common, and that's, oop, that's us and our kin. Um, there are the marsupials. Um, and then there are the monotremes, the only surviving egg-laying mammals, so the platypus and the several species of echidna. Um, but there were actually many, many types of mammals that existed in the Mesozoic, and several of these groups actually survived the extinction event, only to go extinct sometime in the Cenozoic. Uh, the most famous of these are the multi-tuberculates. Uh, multis are, which we call them for short, Multis are actually common from the Jurassic until about the middle of the Cenozoic. And if you work um, out at micro sites, the sites where the smaller vertebrate fossils are common, it's quite likely you're going to find micro, uh, uh, multi tuberculate teeth. Um, ecologically, some of them were very similar to rodents. They had ever growing incisors, so they were gnawing forms. At least some were climbers, although there were burrowers as well. Um, they, they die out at the Oligocene, so, sort of the mid part of the, of the Cenozoic, uh, but up until then they're really common. Uh, but they had some cousins that lasted even longer uh, up into the Miocene, uh, and these include uh, the Gondwanotheres. So, and collectively, the Gondwanotheres and the multi tuberculates are called the Allotheres. And if any of you are fans of They Might Be Giants, um, there's the song uh, Mammal. And in there, they refer to Dead Uncle Allotheria, the only song, to my knowledge, <laughs> that references Allotheria. And so here is Patagonia. You might guess what continent it's from. Um, the last of the Allotheres, living side by side with the last of another group of more typically uh, Mesozoic forms, but they survive into the mid Cenozoic, the Dryolestoids. Um, and we had plenty of other things. These are proto or, or stem placentals, closer to the placentals than to anything else, but not within the true placentalia. Things like the simolestids, uh, including the longest tails in the history of life. And it looks like it's got Mickey Mouse ears, but those are actually its shoulder blades. That's the way that specimen happens to be uh, preserved. Um, or the teniodonts, uh, which were not actually very small, although I don't work on these guys, but I would like to be able to find a really small one and name it Teeny, teeny Weenie Adon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What's that? Pseudo placentals. Yeah, they're they're sort of well, they are they are closer to placentals than to anything else, but the definition of placentalia is the most recent common ancestor of the of the living groups and all of its descendants, and these guys branch off before then. They may have been fully placental in, for, in terms of their reproductive anatomy, we just don't know. Right, so, um, so yeah, you, you find where that common ancestor is, and so the, the, the major groups that you use to anchor that are the Afrotheres, which are elephants, manatees, and their kin, uh, the Xenarthrins, which are uh, sloths, armadillos, and anteaters, and everybody else. Uh, that's a group that's everybody else. Um, and you find that common ancestor and the traits that unify them. And recent studies put the teenidons and the simolestids and so forth outside that. Although some old analyses put them within that. Um, there's also the tilodonts, so you know, things that 
occasionally you might see on illustrations of animals from the early part of the age of mammals, or the pantodonts, which, you know, walk, walked up hills going, <sighs> no, um, which are kind of bulky guys. They actually, the pantodonts include the first really large bodied uh, placental mammals, animals the size of, say, a black bear up to about uh, a small rhino. So uh, Bima lamba up here is one. Um, or the, one of the most common ones, Corypidon. In fact, if you work in the Eocene of, of Eastern North America and the right formations, Corypidons are like one of the most common things you come across. That is fragments of Corypidon. Um, there are also pseudo marsupials or stem marsupials, uh, the sparacidonts, um, which are not within marsupalia proper. And marsupalia has a similar definition. It's the most recent common ancestor of all living marsupials and all of its descendants. And there's this other group, it used to be called the borhyenoids, but it's been expanded to include a couple other forms, that are outside living marsupials but are closer to them than anything else. And the cool thing about the sparacidonts is that by and large they were carnivores. They were the carnivorous equivalent, well, they were the, sorry, the marsupial line equivalent to the carnivorans among the placentals. Uh, some of them were sort of roughly hyena-like, so boar hyena, the name means southern hyena. Oh, I should mention, the uh, sparacidonts are predominantly a South American group. Some of them are found in other regions, including um, in, in Asia, there's a Cretaceous Asian form, um, but most of them are in South America. So here's a reconstruction of boar hyena. Um, most famously, there are uh, pseudo saber cats. So it is a saber cat, only it's a marsupial. Uh, and it was doing it long before the saber cats were around. So here's a reconstruction of it uh, strutting its stuff in, uh, in South America. So Thylacosmilus, the saber, the, the pouch saber. Um, but of course, there are true marsupials as well, and marsupials did more than produce all the weird and wonderful things that we see in Australia today and South America and then our own opossum. So among the Australasian marsupials, here's a weird one that's sort of also getting that um, gnawing, ever-growing incisor form. Um, although uh, parts of it seem to be sort of like an eye eye, that really weird lemur. And when you're a weird lemur, that's saying something. <laughs> uh, only it's a, uh, it's a marsupial version. Um, there were kangaroos, but kangaroos of different form than modern ones. For instance, there were kangaroos that were monodactyl, that only had a single toe. So sort of a kangaroo with a horse foot. Um, there were giant kangaroos. So these are shown to scale. This is Macropus. This is the red kangaroo of today. So this is, you know, two or more times as heavy and much more massively built. And there is a debate as to whether these guys hopped or not. I don't have a position on that. Um, there were carnivores in Australasia, of course. Uh, here's Thylacoleo, sometimes called the, well, its name literally is the pouched lion. Although I think marsupial jaguar is probably better because it was more Although they probably lived in the plains as well, it looks like it was a very good climber, and jaguars or leopards uh, are better models. And, and this is sort of a heavily built animal, so I think jaguar is a better model. Yeah. Right. Um, so these, this, these particular forms then are definitely within the group marsupalia. They fall, sorry, within the, the, the group of marsupials. Uh, and therefore would have almost certainly have had the marsupial reproductive pattern. Whether something like the sparacidonts did becomes less certain because they're outside that living group and there aren't always bony tissues that let us know what that soft tissue reproductive anatomy is like. And for instance, it, you may have heard of the marsupial bone before if you took mammalogy before. Uh, only the marsupial bone, which was thought to support the pouch, is found in many types of animals, many types of mammals, many of whom don't have uh, pouches. And in fact, it's found in monotremes and egg-laying mammals, so it actually isn't associated. It isn't, its present doesn't demonstrate the presence of a pouch. But these guys, because they are closer to some living marsupials than to some other living marsupials, would have been pouched mammals. So here's a, a reconstruction of Thylacoleo. And there are some that are just, you know, what the hell? You know, this is, you know, things that, you know, give them a phaser and the symbol, you know, could have been, you know, on, they could have been officers in Starfleet or something. 
Um, you know, they're really cute. You know, it's going to get an officer schmunk going along, you know. Um, I don't know. They're sort of tapiroid, but not exactly. Um, most famous, probably, of the, of the giant marsupials was indeed the largest of the marsupials, uh, Diprotodon, which was basically just a big ass wombat. I mean, it's a wombat the size of a rhino. Uh, but it wasn't that only marsupials were around in Australasia. Australasia today, of course, has a lot of birds and lizards and crocs, and there were a lot of birds and lizards and crocs back then, too even up to very close to modern times. So here, compared to Diprotodon, um, is um, uh, Geriornis, which uh, was one of the largest of the birds of, of Australasia, initially thought to be part of this whole group that includes emus and ostriches and so forth. But it turns out its lineage, uh, and I'll show another example of it, were closer to ducks. So they are independent radiation of flightless giant birds. Uh, we had uh, giant snakes. So here is a, um, a constrictor snake, although it's not a member of the, Poa, of the boa python group. It's independently evolved constriction. There it is doing a job on Thylacoleo. There were the club-tailed uh, turtles. So this radiation of turtles in the Indo-Pacific, uh, the Maolanids. Um, and one of whom, I don't show it here, is called Ninjamus, which literally means Ninja Turtle. Oh. Um, yep, and, and in fact, the, in the paper where it's described, uh, you, uh, Gene Gaffney, it, the etymology scene is something like, named after those four totally rad dudes. <laughs> and I'm still waiting, because there's no reference to the creator and the publisher of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, so I'm waiting for some, you know, Argentine paleontologists and 75 years from now reading this, I thought this paper was in English. What is this? <laughs> um, and then there were giant monitor lizards, giant Komodo dragons um, that lived on the mainland of Australia. And what's really cool is Diprotodon and Wanambia and Myolania and Geriornis and Varanus priscus all were there when the first humans arrived to Australasia. So that would have been pretty cool. A, a earlier representative of the Geriornis line was even larger, um, and that's Bullockornis. And it was from specimens like this, you can see it next to a work table, uh, that, that they were able to recognize this isn't a ratite, it isn't in the group that includes ostriches and so forth. Um, it is closer to, it's an anseriform, so it's in the duck, swan, goose lineage. Um, with this deeper beak, at least some people uh, Inter interpreted it as a carnivore, as a flesh eater, um, although it's not universally recognized. And so it was given this typically Australian nickname, the Demon Duck of Doom. <laughs> uh, so uh, whether it actually was a carnivore or not, and even if it was a carnivore, if it preyed after large items or just small items, it's not known. They were not. They were an independent radiation, although I'm going to get, get to the terror birds shortly. So there's a lot of independent origin of flightlessness um, and carnivorous flightlessness at the time. On the other hand, there's a lot of flighted forms, volant forms, uh, in the Cenozoic. So here is a false-toothed bird, a pel uh, pelagornithid. Um, they were sort of widespread in the oceans. They're an ocean-going bird. They're part of this larger assemblage that also includes things like albatrosses. And these include the widest wingspan of any bird. I don't know if any of you were at the 9 o'clock presentation in this room about this wonderful specimens in amber. I really hope that the, um, the speaker comes back and talks a lot about, I think, I think if he gives a talk about flight mechanics, that would be really cool, you know, extrapolating, you know, maybe to the flight of dragons or something. But he mentioned these, and well, actually he didn't mention these, he mentioned the next sort of flying bird I'm going to talk about. But there is a lot of work on these guys. They're false toothed in that they're, they're not actual teeth but they have projections from the beak that came down to function like teeth. Um, and they were big. So here to scale are the royal albatross and the California condor. <laughs> so one of each of those makes up one of its wings. Um, so Pelagornis, a tremendously large bird, but with these really, as far as we can tell, long tapered wings like an albatross, so an oceanic soarer. In contrast, there were forms that had the condor pattern. 
Um, and that was the Territorns of, of South America and eventually North America, the largest of which is the largest bird that we know of capable of flight, Argentavis. Its wingspan wasn't quite as big, but was a broader winged form. Um, so here is a reconstruction of Argentavis versus a human being. So pushing the limits of what we know of feathered flight. Uh, so compared to an Andean condor, um, so yeah, tremendously big bird. How much would it have weighed? Good question. And I know that there are estimates, and I can't remember what they are offhand. Standing, it probably would have stood something like that. So you know, a condor that could look you, or a condor relative that could sort of look you in the eye. So, uh, however, um, also famous from South America are some really large flightless birds. Although the smaller representatives of this group are actually flying. Um, so unlike ostriches and so forth. They had some close flying relatives that were still around. Some of these guys were still flying. Um, related to the Seriamas of today, which are still um, a group of, of South American running predators. The largest of which, though, definitely were not flying and were definitely carnivores. There's not a question about this. This is a group called the Terror Birds, some of whom actually made their way into North America as part of the Great American Biotic Interchange, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So here's. Well, there was a, there was a predator, the, the, the forest rakids as a group, yeah, they were one of the dominant predators of South America from basically the Eocene until the Pliocene. Sort of side by side were the terror birds and the sparacidont near marsupials as the top predators in South America. Um, so a different world. Um, and if you've read Alan Steele's um, Coyote, uh, novels, a seri series of novels and short stories, their world, the coyote, the top predators on land are inspired by the terror birds. They're the boids, um, as they're called, the boids. And South America was isolated for most of the Cenozoic from the other continents. It was an island continent and it didn't have much exchange with the other parts of the world. So here is that 40 million years ago. And whereas there are nice land connections, between, sorry, the northern continents um, and on and off uh, connections eventually with Africa, Australia, South America, and Antarctica were all very isolated and had really weird assemblages of animals. So uh, among the mammals of South America, this is where the sloths got going and the greatest diversity of sloths are in South America. And there actually is a lot of diversity of sloths. So sort of at the ends of the spectrum, we have little Bradypus, one of the two living uh, tree sloths. And Megatherium, the um, simply named Megatherium, it means big animal. Um, <laughs> it was one of the first fossil creatures named. So it, yeah, back then, it was simple to give them names. And it's about the size of an elephant. Um, so sort of the end members in terms of size. There were intermediate forms. So here's Lestodon, about the size of a, maybe a grizzly. Uh, Eremetherium was almost as big as Megatherium, and it made its way into southern North America, actually. And here's something really cool, is we now have tr lots of trace fossils of ground sloths, including tunnels. So at least some of them were burrowers. Um, as you can see, this guy, you know, inside the tunnel, and there's, you know, some very large ones. Um, we can see the scratch marks from their big claws on the side. Um, so there's a series of recent papers, and here's a reconstruction of, of them. We can see what looks like their pattern of going in and going back out and then going back. They're sloths, after all. So, you know, they're not going to do a lot of work any one time. Um, and so I just love this. Anyway. Um, so yeah, and, and we have also, we've, we've actually long known some of their other trace fossils. Um, so here's Megalonyx. This was a sloth that lived in this area. Uh, first specimen described by Thomas Jefferson, although he got his affinity wrong. He thought it was a lion. He only had claws to work on, so. Uh, we have trackways of ground sloths um, and poop. <laughs> There's lots of sloth poop that's known, particularly from the American West, where it's nice and dry. And so here's a room full of sloth poop from Nothrotheriops, from the, the Shasta sloth. And some of the sloths went to sea. 
So, you know, it seems strange. Why would sloths go out to the sea? Well, first of all, sloths are actually really good swimmers. Even today's tree sloths. If you see Planet Earth 2 in the first episode of the new Planet Earth 2 series, there's a, you know, a tree sloth just swimming along. In fact, they can go faster in the water than they can on land or in trees. So. <laughs> Oh, exactly. Yeah, damned my faint phrase there. But there's this one genus um, that lived in, this, in the water, in the near shore environment, eating kelp and so forth, and sea grasses. Uh, here's another reconstruction. We don't know whether it was shaggy or whether it lost its fur, unfortunately. And there's even within that genus, we see a, a transformation as time goes by to forms which had longer, more, more bill-like snouts for grasping the sea plants to eat, which is pretty cool. Uh, their cousins are the cingulates. Cingulates survive today as armadillos. They had some earlier relatives. So here's one with a couple of horns on its head. Um, a horned armadillo, although well, technically not in armadillos. And another one, a close relative of the armadillos, um, shown about life size. This is uh, a pampathier. Um, and then the glyptodonts, which recent discoveries show are actually true armadillos. They are not cousins of the armadillos. They are nested within the armadillos and are closer, closer to the fairy armadillos and the giant armadillos, which is a, a, a modern genus, than they are to the nine-banded and seven-banded and so forth, which include the forms that made it to North America. Uh, but unlike the other armadillos, they, their armor is all fused, so instead of rolling up and hopefully you've all seen the little gif of the one armadillo that pops up and turns into a little ball. I should have put that in there, but oh well. Uh, these guys had fused body armor, so they would just tuck their head in. And some of these guys, including um, uh, uh, Dewitakiris, is part of what my colleague Victoria Arbor calls the Tail Club Club. Um, <laughs> so the Tail Club Club are the ankylosaurids, um, the megalania, uh, so the myelanian turtles, which I show, showed earlier, and some of the glyptodonts. Um, and yeah, so they had a great big club at the end of the tail. And uh, almost certainly used, at least in part, as a defensive weapon, but almost all weapons in, you know, in, in animals are used mostly in intra-specific combat. So here's some whacking on each other with their big clubs. Um, South America is also famous for its own radiation of its native ungulates, um, so ungulate is a term for hoofed mammal, and we've known of several types of hoofed mammals unique to South America during the Cenozoic, and their evolutionary position was really puzzling for a long time. We didn't know where they fit. It turns out two of them from two different groups, this guy, uh, Macrochenia, um, and um, Toxodon, which I'll show in a bit, which looks more like a, it's a galumphing form, looks kind of like a rhino. Um, we now have their DNA because they made it up to a mere, you know, 15,000 years ago. And they are close to, they're closer to each other than to anything alive today. And closer to the perissodactyls, the horses, tapers, and rhinos, than they are to anything else. So they're like an early divergent branch of the perissodactyls. So some are things like macrochenia, which seems to have been sort of a llama-like form, although it's not a llama, it's not a camelid. Uh, camelids are a totally different group that sort of displaced them. Its name even means basically big, uh, big, big llama. Uh, it has this, this blowhole on the top of its head, only it's probably not a blowhole. It probably had sort of a taper-like snout in front of it. Um, and here's, you know, the Thoetherium, um, little horsey-looking guys. Oh, they're really tiny guys. They're, they're not horse-sized at all. Uh, but they independently evolved a horse foot. A single, a single walking toe. And in fact, they went even further than horses. They lost the little, almost all of the little side bones that horses had. Giving the world a finger. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, horses are continuously flipping you off. And, you know. <laughs> um, and then the other branch that we have the, the DNA from is on this side, more robust forms, although some little guys that were sort of pseudo rabbits. Uh, but the big one, Toxodon, made it almost to modern times. It would have encountered Paleo-Indians and then stopped encountering them. Because, <laughs> um, and the DNA from Macrochenia and Toxodon is what's used to pin them down to the um, stem of Perissodactyla. And then there are some that unfortunately died out too early, and so we don't have their DNA. So where Astropotherium and Pyrotherium and so forth fit, we still don't know. There's some... Not overwhelming, but some osteological, some bony evidence that they are part of the same radiation 
as Toxodon and Macrocania. So there may be a single group of South American ungulates. Um, then there are things like the Desmostylians, uh, a group once thought to be closer to elephants, but new information says are probably closer to the perissodactyls, that were aquatic forms of the Pacific Northwest, or those of the Northern Pacific. So in North America, the Pacific Northwest, in Asia, Korea, Japan, Siberia. Uh, they would have been kelp eaters, we think. Uh, they weren't obviously fast-moving sea creatures, but they were sea creatures. Um, very odd proportions. They could come up on land, and their teeth are just freaking weird. Um, so they, they've got these deep pits in the teeth. So we see the enamel and then denti, excuse me, pits in the middle. How they use them isn't certain. They don't quite seem to be the right form for crushing. So mollusk crushing might make sense if these were capped over, but having that open pit, about five million years ago or so, the um, Isthmus of Panama forms. There's, it had precursors going on before it, but it became a permanent structure about five million years ago, at which point we get Gabby. Gabby is a great American biotic interchange where a lot of North American mammals went south and some South American animals and, and birds went north. So among the things that the South got are things that have since disappeared, like elephants and horses and, well, bears, although there's some bears still around down there, uh, but also things that have done uh, fairly well ever since, like the camelids, the ancestors of the llamas and vicuñas and so forth, uh, the cats, the skunks, the deer, and of course, eventually, humans. Um, as well as things like uh, the peccaries and the, um, uh, the coatamundis, the ancestors of the coatis. So creatures that we think of as typically South American were North American immigrants. In our direction, we got in, in tropical North America, we got various types of monkeys, uh, and we got um, some of the South American rodents. We have sloths in places like Panama and so forth. In our part of the world, we got the Virginia opossum. We used to have the giant ground sloths. Giant ground sloths made it all the way to Alaska, and they actually did really well in North America until about the arrival of the uh, Paleo-Indians. Um, and we got the armadillos. So you know, they're not really common in this area now, but we had them here for a while, and of course they're doing really well in the south and southwest. So here's during Gabby, you know, these North American forms going south, and these guys heading north. So, um, oh yeah, um, porcupines. Porcupines, which of course have gone all the way up, way up into Canada and Alaska, are a South American type of rodent. Um, and speaking of rabbits and rodents, which are, rabbits are not rodents, but they're cousins of the rodents. I want to show you some examples of fossil ones. Here is a giant lagomorph, a giant rabbit. Um, unfortunately, always shown with the neck sticking straight out. Almost certainly it would have been doing this the way modern rabbits do, uh, but probably way too big. That's it shown against you know, a modern rabbit. Uh, probably not much of a hopper, or at least not a fast hopper. Um, there were horned gophers. Well, technically it's not a gopher, but it lived like a gopher. So independently of the horned armadillos, they also have these paired horns. You know, maybe to defend their hole. We don't know for certain. These were, though, in the American West. We used to have plastic toys of these. When I was a kid, there, were, like, there was a set of plastic fossil mammals, and, and Ceratogalus was in there. And shown about life size, the largest of the beavers. And Castoroides was a true beaver. It probably made beaver dams and beaver lodges and so forth, but about, got up to about the size of a black bear. <laughs> um, but that was not the largest rodent. The largest rodent was a giant capybara relative. Um, and here it is. <laughs> so, so if you have a, a science fiction story set in, uh, in ancient, uh, ancient South America, ride my mighty steed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so yeah. Um, well, at least he's got the nice car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and then these guys, these are part of the African radiation of mammals. And as you can see, when they started off, they weren't tremendously different from each other, but both of these forms have living descendants. So these are both long body, they have extra vertebrae, that's a characteristic of the Afrothiers. Um, they have a pair of tusks in the upper and lower jaw. Uh, Pizosiren. Um, which actually is from the Caribbean, there's some exchange there going on, um, was an ancestor of a sea cow. So it was a land sea cow. Um, or it is the land creature from which, or the amphibious creature from which sea cows evolved, things like manatees and dugongs and so forth. Metaxi is actually a pretty common fossil animal if you go down to um, 
uh, Calvert Cliffs and Aurora deposits and so forth, very common bones. But the other branch is the ancestor of the elephants. And sea cows and elephants are each other's closest living relatives. And it's through things like that we got eventually the dinotheres, in which case the upper tusks were suppressed and the lower tusks were huge. Uh, there's Dinotherium itself, one of the largest land mammals of all time. Um, and then the, the, the mastodonts and from them, uh, well, the shovel tuskers. Um, yeah, those are pretty cool. Um, and then the, uh, the true elephants eventually. Even in familiar groups like antelopes, like wildebeests, there are some surprises. This is Rusingorix. Uh, most of it is a sort of a typical wildebeest. But it turns out its nasal passageway does this big loop up and loop back and is very reminiscent of the crests of some of the duckbill dinosaurs. And very likely it used them in a similar fashion to generate sound, so the, the mighty thrums or whatever of the Rusingorix. Um, so this is you know, the comparable thing in a, a duckbill dinosaur. Uh, I mentioned Terminator pigs before. Here is a Terminator pig. That is their nickname, but they are not true pigs. Uh, and telodonts are cloven hoof mammals. Uh, they were quite large, to the size of a rhino. Uh, they were probably omnivores, and at that body size, you could eat an animal the size of a pig. Um, but their closest living relatives are hippos, and the closest other living relative of hippos, uh, which are creatures I will get to momentarily. So here is a terminator pig charging through the prairie of ancient Nebraska. Uh, here's a close relative of the terminator pigs. Uh, sometimes shown as sort of a wolf-like form, but all we have is the skull, and it is probably more similar in anatomy to its relatives, the hippos and the other group. It's teasing, aren't I? Uh, so here is its skull compared to the skull of a grizzly um, or a big wolf, one of the largest carnivorous land mammals of all time. So here's a modern reconstruction of Andrew Sarkis. We still don't have the, post the, the skeleton behind the skull, so this is still imaginary. Um, but hippos and things like Andrew Sarkis and the Terminator pigs have the closest relatives of as hippos and the cetaceans, the whales. So whales are cloven hoof mammals. Good, I'm right on time. Um, they're ants that we actually have a tremendous fossil record of whales. And in part, it's because they did the right thing to become a fossil, and that's live in an environment that's going to preserve, which is the water. Um, because, you know, where sediment settles is where you can get fossils, and sediment settles in the water. Plus, if you have very solid bones, your chance of getting a fossil better. So everything in the dark, bold symbol are living groups, and the ones in the lighter lines are fossils. We have a tremendous knowledge of fossil whales, both of forms within the modern group of whales and the earlier ancestors of whales, including walking whales. So it's only whale in the sense that it's closer to whales than anything else alive. Here's little Indohias, one of the, the earliest representatives of this lineage. So to all, when you would see it, it would be a cloven hoofed mammal that lived in the water and fed on water and land. And from creatures like that, we got slightly larger uh, semi-aquatic creatures that are eating fish. So here's Pachycetus, it is going after some fish. Um, and then eventually more and more aquatic forms coming onto land less and less until you got fully aquatic forms, which if they came up onto land would die. Um, so actual, honest to goodness, fully aquatic whales. And that's the reconstruction of the skeletons uh, of Indohias. Here's Ambulocetus, um, Cuchicetus I showed you before, Myocetus, here we go, to Bacillosaurus. Unfortunate name, it is not a reptile, but you know, that's what the name it's stuck with. Um, and even within the modern whales, the group of modern whales, there are some surprises. Here's the walrus. It is a whale being a walrus, so it had a long single tusk. It's a relative of the narwhals, but it probably used it like a, 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 a walrus does to scrape up mollusks and maybe to sense things in the water. Uh, there it is, you know, whale were single around. There were giant whale-eating sperm whales, so Leviathan. Uh, Leviathan Melvilleye, named after uh, Melville. Um, one of the largest predators the oceans have ever had. Uh, oh, there it is in comparison to an obscure sort of late Cretaceous Silurosaur called Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, 
Uh, we have early baleen whales. In fact, we have baleen whales before they had baleen. So that is members of the lineage that today is all baleen whales. Early on, they were smaller bodied animals that ate large fish or proportionally large fish. And then they started eating small fish and they started gulp eating small fish. And then they began to shift to larger body size as they were eating sort of lower on the food chain and eating bulk food at once and uh, becoming eventually quite giant. So here is my friend and colleague Sarah, who granted is a small bodied individual, but, and that's a skull of a blue whale. And to be fair, that's not an adult blue whale. Um, and it turns out in a paper that came out this last week, giant baleen whales are extremely recent. Most baleen whales in their history were about the size of the minke whale or smaller, uh, so 20 feet or so. Big as land animals go, but small as baleen whales go. A new paper, oh, here is a reconstruction to show how big baleen whales get. And if you are a graphic designer and you have an animal with a color in its name, use that damn color, blue whale. Anyway, so um, this paper that just came, yeah. This paper that just came out um, is, um, looks at the size, so in, in the dots here are the size of different species of baleen whale over time. In here, the cone is representing a Brownian motion simulation of size. And in fact, this giant increase doesn't fit the Brownian motion, mo motion model at all. There's a major inflection point, and that inflection point coincides um, independently, actually, in different groups of baleen whales with the onset of really cold bottom water temperatures in the ocean and the onset of the, of the Panama, the Isthmus of Panama. So it looks like as the world shifted into an ice age world, you started to get much stronger air currents coming off of the continents, which at least seasonally, which produced great upwelling in the upwelling centers of the world, which produced a lot of nutrients, so the great plankton blooms to feed the giant baleen whales. So, the connection between oceanography and plate tectonics and biology. Um, and I just want to end to say that also in all this time, there are other things going on of small bodied tree dwelling forms that eventually came down onto land. Um, but there's plenty of other information of that out there. And the age of mammals is more than the age of our origin. And it looks like I'm just finished, I just finished up on time. And here is, I'm going to end with a footprint of a cave bear. So there we go. Yeah.